Hello and welcome back to the channel. So one of the biggest drawbacks of retro consoles is that there is no straightforward way to get a signal on a modern TV or screen that only has HDMI as an input option. Take the N64 for example. This console puts out a composite video signal, which uses these RCA connectors to get an analog signal to the screen and therefore is not compatible with modern TVs because HDMI is a digital only input. But fret not, there are several ways to tackle this problem. First, there are simple conversion boxes that are dangling out of the multi-port. The best example for it would be the Eon Super 64 adapter, but I couldn't find it in stock anywhere. There are also a lot of knockoffs from that. And among a few others, there is the exceptional RetroTink 5X Pro, which quickly became the gold standard in the retro community for converting analog video signals to digital. This isn't a cheap device by any means, and well worth the money. However, today we take a look on a really weird and omnious HDMI mod for the N64 which I bought from AliExpress. And after that we compare it to the more, let's say, substantial upgrades. So let's start right in. This here is my old and trusty N64 from back in the day. And believe me when I say I played the living hell out of it. I have fond memories waking up on Saturday morning and starting a fresh playthrough of Zelda Ocarina of Time just to see how far I can get in one day. I did not know that speedrunning was a thing even back in the day, but I got carried away here. And in this little plastic case is what we are looking for. The high speed IDO, yes, I googled it and found out how to pronounce it correctly, N64 HDMI mod kit. It contains just two things, the ribbon cable which we need to solder onto the RCP NAS chip and our PCB with the HDMI out. Oh, and they even thrown in our HDMI mini to full size adapter. Neat. Okay, so let's get over all the things we need for the install. First and foremost, a soldering iron. A cheap one like this should do fine. However, please note that this is really fine pitch soldering. Therefore, a fine tip like this is recommended for accomplishing our task. We also need some solder, soldering wick, a little bit of flux and some tools like a game bit driver to get in the N64 in the first place. There is also a need to cut the shell to have access to the mini HDMI out. So I also have a sharp crafting knife ready. Okay, so let's get inside that N64. First things first, we need to remove the expansion pack at the top of the console. After that, there are six screws at the bottom, which we're removing with the game bit driver. When removed, flip the console once more and remove the top shell and set it aside. Now let's remove the heatsink. There are 28 screws which are holding everything together. I recommend making a picture right before you start getting them all out so you know where everything goes once we are finished. With that the whole metal housing should come out easily. Now there are some heat sinks on the chips, which we are gently removed to expose the one we need for our operation. The RCP NUS, which stands for Reality Coprocessor. The suffix NUS actually stands for Nintendo Ultra 64, the console's project name while in development. I give everything a good clean before we start soldering because I haven't been in here for years. Now comes the crucial part, soldering the ribbon cable. If you attempt this, please focus and always double check before you go in, as with any other micro soldering operation. We need to align the ribbon cable with pin number 6 of the RCP chip, which is the one right here, counted up from down right. The ribbon cable is really fragile and even though it is made to be soldered on, it doesn't really hold that much resistance against long streaks of heat. So be delicate and quick and use plenty of flux. To make my life a little bit easier, I use a small strip of Kapton tape to secure the cable in place so it is not moving around during soldering. To verify a good connection, I use a pair of tweezers to check if the joint is good. You could also use a multimeter to check for shorts. After that, we need to solder this part of the ribbon cable to this connector labeled 5 volts. The other one goes to the second leg from down right of the PIF chip, which stands for Peripheral Interface Bus. This enables us to get in the menu of the HDMI mod with our controller later. And with that, soldering is done for now, but we still need to prepare the bottom shell for the HDMI board, so let's take a closer look there. We need to make a cutout right here, and we also need to cut on that screw post a little. 
Take your time cutting down for a clean result. It is better to shave off little by little than all at once. Please note that the process can look different to you depending on what console revision or region you are in. Once we are happy with the result, we get the motherboard back in and connect the ribbon cable with the HDMI board. Okay, moment of truth. I put everything together just to um, try out if the HDMI is actually working. So let's take a look. Ah! It's working. Come on. Why does it take so long? There it is. Sweet. Remember when I said that this is really a delicate mod, so I already managed to broke this cable here and um, now I couldn't go into the menu. I managed to solve this problem by just connecting this jumper wire with this connector right here. All right, everything seems to work fine now. So let's put everything back together. To protect the ribbon cable a little bit, I put down Captain tape on both the motherboard and the heatsink. It should be fine without it, but still, better safe than sorry. Now with everything working, let's take a look on how it's performing. As you can see, the menu, which you can access by pressing the start, A and B button at the same time, is quite simple. We can navigate the menu with the C buttons. The video mode seems to be like some sort of um, contrast setting, while color mode is offering different color filters. But the only thing I really care about is the aspect ratio option. This mod actually puts out a 720p signal while mode 1 seems to leave the original aspect ratio untouched and leaves a uh, black canvas around it, mode 2 stretches the native 4x3 to more like a 16x9 image, and mode 3 seems to go a little overboard and overscans the image a tad, at least on my PAL region N64. And before we dive into the conclusion, let's talk about today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWare is your one-stop solution for anything around PCB prototyping and manufacturing. They also offer 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication and even injection molding. They have a wide range of services to aid you in every step of bringing your next project to life. Ordering through the website is also very easy and there is an online chat available if you need help at every step of the ordering process. Again, big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and check them out in the link in the description down below. Now let's wrap up this video. You see, this is not an easy mod to solder in your precious N64 and with a price point that cheap, there are certainly some drawbacks. First of it all, there is no support, like zero. As I bought this kit from AliExpress, I can be lucky enough that the package arrived in the first place. Also, I promise you that there won't be any firmware updates whatsoever with this mod, as these knockoff mods are often get updated and then sold as a v2 or v3 version, basically making the original version abandonware. And then there's the big elephant in the room, picture quality. Thanks to the amazing circuit board forum community, I was able to source some comparison footage made by Flat Eric and ManCloud. And as you can see, well, with other mods like the N64 Digital or the N64 Advanced 2, there is not only more resolution and therefore better image quality available, there are also way more options to fine tune the image and more control over what is really happening on the output side. I've listed a comparison video in the description down below if you want to pixel peep and take a closer look on what is going on. Also, the audio channels are switched. I have put Mario right next to the waterfall and the sound from that should come on the left side, but hear for yourself. It is not the end of the world, but still a drawback. But not all is doom and gloom. There are certainly some pros on that list too. One of the biggest factors, the price. Price really drives sales and I get why people are buying this kit. Everybody's price point is different and I think this is a nice way to get into your console and learn the ins and outs of soldering, even though I wouldn't recommend this kit for an absolute beginner. 
Other than that, it definitely solves what it was made for, making your N64 compatible with modern displays or capture cards. I think it's an easy way for streamers to take that footage, put it into OBS and crop the black borders to stream for their audience. In the end, I would say if you seek for better image quality, better overall support, firmware updates and so on, just hold on a little longer and save up for great solutions by community members, like the N64 Advance 2 by Borti or something like a pixel FX gem. Otherwise, this was a fun project with a problem that wasn't easy to solve at this price point for years. Thank you so much for watching the video and if you'd like what you see, I have lots more videos about modding retro consoles on my channel, so stay subscribed for more in the future. I'd love to see you there. I am Paul, this is my little mod job and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.